welcome to another exciting class. This is Dr. Bison EM, Excellent Grades Academy. Today we are having a lesson on body fluid compartments and an introduction to cell physiology. Let's get into our lesson. So physiology. So the burning question in the introduction is, what is physiology? Human physiology is described as the science of the mechanical, physical, and biochemical functions of humans in good health, their organs, and the cells of which they are composed of. Now, in human physiology, we study how body tissues function. Most people ask, what is the difference between human physiology and human anatomy? Human anatomy is concerned with the structure and the function of tissues and organs, while human physiology is concerned with how body organs and tissues function in a good condition for human beings. Now, human physiology focuses principally at the level of organs and, system, and systems. But to understand the physiology of organs and systems, we need to do or to understand the physiology of the cell. Okay. Now, let's look at body compartments. In body compartments, we're going to look at total body water. So total body water is the total amount of water in the body. Total body water is distributed in different compartments. And it is distributed as follows. Number one, we have the intracellular fluid. This is fluid that is found inside of your body cells. Number two is extracellular fluid. This is the total amount of fluid that is found in the spaces outside of the cells and in the blood vessels. Total amount of fluid that is found outside of the cell. Extracellular fluid, interestingly, is divided into interstitial fluid and your vascular fluid. Interstitial fluid is a fluid that surrounds the cells. Sometimes it is referred to as bathing fluid. Vascular fluid is also known as plasma or intravascular fluid. This is a fluid component of blood. Okay. Now, how do you calculate fluid that is found in different body compartments and how do you calculate total body water now what you need to know is that total body water is calculated from body weight and the percentages of total body water that contributes to body weight is very different according to age and sex okay so intracellular fluid is approximately two-thirds of total body water. Extracellular fluid is approximately one-third of total body water. We need to understand that most of the water in our bodies is found inside of our cells. This statement supports it. Two-thirds of total body water is inside of the cells, and only one-third is outside of the cells. Now, we said extracellular fluid is divided into interstitial fluid and vascular fluid. Interstitial fluid is approximately two-thirds of extracellular fluid. Other literature say it is approximately three over four of extracellular fluid. Vascular fluid is approximately one-third of extracellular fluid. Other literature put it as one-fourth of extracellular fluid. Okay, so this is a schematic diagram showing us how fluid is distributed in different body compartments. So as you can see here where my cursor is, total body water is about 60% of body weight. This applies to an adult male. An adult male. So 60% of for example, we say we have a male who is 70 kg. 60% of 70 kg will give us a total body water of 42 liters. Now, these 42 liters, two-thirds will be in the 
intracellular compartment. It will be inside of the cell. So two thirds of 42 liters will give us 28 liters. And only one third will be in the extracellular fluid compartment. One third of 42 liters is 14 liters. Remember, we say that extracellular fluid is divided into interstitial fluid and plasma fluid. And we say that interstitial fluid is 3 over 4 of extracellular fluid. So 80% of extracellular fluid is found just outside of the cells and outside of the blood vessels. And 1 over 4 or 20% of extracellular fluid is found in the blood vessels as vascular fluid or plasma. Okay, let's move on. Now, compartmentalization is an important general principle in physiology, meaning everyone has to understand compartmentalization and the amount and percentages of fluid that is found in each compartment. This we've already talked about, that ECF is divided into interstitial fluid and circulating blood plasma. All right. So the interstitial fluid is part of the ECF that is outside the vascular system, bathing the cells. That's why it was earlier alluded to that in, uh, interstitial fluid is also known as bathing fluid because it bathes the cells. On average, 60% of the body weight of a young adult is water. The remaining 18% of the body weight is protein and related substances. 7% are minerals and 15% is fat. Alright, now let us look at the differences and the comparisons between intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. So these two compartments are separated by cell membranes. We generally have the following important characteristics. So remember that what separates the cell from the extracellular matrix is the cell membrane. So inside of, this, of your cell membrane uh, is the intercellular fluid, and outside of the cell membrane is the extracellular fluid. Now, the cell membrane has got the following characteristics. Number one, it is freely permeable to water. In a steady state, intracellular and extracellular osmolarity will be the same. We are going to introduce the concept of osmolarity as we go on in this video. Normally, the osmolarity of cells is approximately 295 milliosmos that is close to 300 milliosmos the cell membrane is impermeable to sodium chloride as we do transport across the cell membrane we're going to see how sodium and chloride move across in and out of the cells using transport channels the difference in the concentration of impermeable particles determines the osmotic movement of water across the cell membrane. So sodium inside of the cell and outside of the cell is different. And according to where the sodium is highest, that's where the water is going to move. The concentration of these particles is often referred to as effective osmolarity of a particular compartment. As, as I said earlier, we're going to explain osmolarity as we go on in this video. Now, blood volume contains both plasma, the fluid components, and it contains packed cells. The packed cells contains the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. Okay, so now blood volume is plasma plus the packed red blood cells that is called hematocriti. So total blood volume is equals to plasma times 100 over uh, 100 minus hematocritic, something that we're going to talk about. All right. Now, let's look at factors affecting total body water. Okay. So total body water varies depending on the sex and the age. 
the first thing that affects total body water is the age. In infants, total body water is 73 to 80%. In males, it is about 60%. In females, it is 40 to 50%. And obesity also affects the amount of total body water one has in their body. If you have too much fat in your body, it means that the total amount of water is affected. In the old age, total body water reduces to 45% because the cells lose their integrity and there's a lot of intracellular fluid that is easily lost. Alright, now this diagram shows us the percentage of water in tissues in infants, in adult males, and in adult females. In newborns, the total amount of water is actually a range. It is 75 to 80%. In adults, males, it is about 60%. In adult females, it is a range as well, 40 to 50%. Right, in old age, it is about 45%. Now, we've talked about the total amount of fluid both in the intracellular compartment and in the extracellular compartment, even in the interstitial and in the intravascular space. Now, what is the ionic and other constituents that are found in the body fluids in ECF and in ICF? So, always remember that the constituents of ICF and ECF are the same, but the concentrations of these constituents differ. The most important constituents that we focus on, number one, are ions. Sodium is more in the ECF than in the ICF. So, this upper compartment here, this upper row, is the extracellular compartment. This lower row here is the intracellular compartment. So as you can see, sodium is higher in the extracellular compartment compared to the intracellular compartment. Potassium is higher in the intracellular compartment compared to the extracellular compartment. Potassium is higher in the extracellular compared to intracellular. Magnesium is higher in the intracellular compared to the extracellular. Chloride is very much high in the extracellular compartment compared to the intracellular compartment. Phosphates and organic anions are higher in the intracellular compartment compared to the extracellular compartment. Bicarbonate is higher in the extracellular compared to the intracellular. Proteins are higher in the intracellular compared to the extracellular compartment. This is a table that is simply showing us what we have been talking about with specific values of the concentrations of the ions and other nutrients. So, sodium is in plasma is about 142, in interstitial fluid 145, inside of the cell it is millimoles per liter. So, take time to go through this table and memorize the values of sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, uh, proteins, and other constituents of the intracellular compartment fluids and the extra compartment fluid for plasma and for interstitial fluid as well because it is very important to know. Okay. So this is the literature that is just explaining what we've been looking at. The intracellular fluid is separated from the extracellular fluid by the cell membrane. Okay. In contrast to the extracellular membrane, fluid rather, the intracellular fluid contains only small quantities of sodium and chloride ions and almost no calcium ions. This is a very important statement. 
because it is going to help us in explaining the osmolarity of the extracellular and intracellular fluid. Instead, the, S, the ICF contains large amounts of potassium and phosphate ions plus moderate quantities of magnesium and sulfate, all of which have low concentrations in the extracellular fluid. Also, cells contain large amounts of protein, almost four times as much as in the extracellular compartment. Okay. Now, let's move on to Let's move on to a very important aspect of this lesson. How to measure body water in a specific compartment. So to measure body fluids in a specific compartment, we use a method that is termed the stewart Hamilton Indicator Dilution Method. So what happens in the stewart Hamilton Indicator Dilution Method is that an indicator is injected in the body and is used as a tracer for the amount of body water in a compartment that you want to measure. So different indicators are used for measuring different body fluid compartments. So there's always a criteria for a suitable dye or tracer that is used for measuring a compartment. So the criteria is this. One, the dye must mix evenly throughout the compartments that you are seeking to measure. Number two, the dye should be non-toxic. It should have no physiological activity. Remember, we are injecting this dye in an individual. So it's not supposed to cause any bodily harm. Number three, it should mix evenly. Number four, it must have no effect of its own. On the distribution of water or other substances in the body in the body so either the dye must be unchanged when it is injected in the body or when it changes if it changes the amount changed must be known this is very very important and the material that is used the dye that is used, the tracer that is used, the indicator that is used should be relatively easy to measure. It should be very, very easy to measure and to trace. Now, what are some of the different indicators that we use to measure plasma volume, the extracellular volume, and total body water? So if you want to measure plasma, meaning you just want to measure the fluid inside of your blood vessels, the criteria for the dye that should be used is that the substance should not cross the capillaries. When you inject the, the, the indicator in the capillaries, it should just remain inside of your blood vessels. Examples of indicators that are used to measure plasma volume include Evans Blue Dye. Evans Blue Dye. This is the most common one. Evans Blue Dye. And then is radioiodinated albumin. So mostly used is Evans Blue dye. This is what is going to show up in your quiz. Believe you me, Evans Blue dye in measurement of plasma is going to show up, especially when you are trying to calculate total blood volume. So total blood volume, we said, is plasma and you measure the hematocrity as well. So if you are seeking to measure the ECF volume, ECF volume, the substance should cross the capillaries, but it should not cross the cell membrane. So remember, the ECF volume is simply a space that is outside of the cell. So the indicator that you use to measure the volume in the ECF should cross the capillaries when you inject it, when you inject it in the blood vessel, but it should not cross the cell membranes. Examples of indicators that we use to measure ECF include isotonic solutions of sucrose and inulin. So inulin is your most commonly used and sucrose. Sucrose, inulin, manito, or an isotonic solution of sodium chloride. These are the indicators that are used to measure ECF volume. Now, if you want to measure total body water, the total amount of water in the body, the substance should distribute 
evenly in the ICF and in the ECF, meaning that the substance should be able to cross capillaries and it should be able to cross the cell membranes so that it can be distributed both in the ICF and in the ECF. Indicators that are used to measure total body water include heavy water, heavy water, tritiated water, aminopyrin, and antipyrin. So these are substances that we use to measure total body water. Deuterated water, which is just heavy water, G2O, tritiated water, and antipyrin. So this is the literature showing us how total body water is measured. So to measure total body water, we use radioactive water, which is called tritium, or heavy water, which is called deuterium. These forms of water mix with total body water within a few hours after being injected in the blood. And the dilution principle can be used to calculate the total body water. So that the dilution principle is a calculation that we use now to determine the volume of water using the mass of the substance that was injected in the water and its concentration. Something that we'll be discussing very soon. Okay. So now, measurement of total extracellular fluid. We said we use sodium chloride, inulin. We use sucrose, manitol, sulfate. So these should be isotonic solutions to that of plasma, meaning that they should have the same osmolarity to that of plasma. That's when they can be used to measure the total extracellular fluid. Now, remember we said we can measure plasma volume, we can measure the ECF volume, and we can measure the total body water. But how do you measure intracellular volume? So, you determine intracellular volume by subtraction. We know that total body water is simply equals to ICF volume plus ECF volume. So, if we can measure total body water using heavy water, and we can measure ECF using isotonic solutions of inulin or sucrose, our ICF volume is simply going to be total body water minus ECF. That's how you determine the ICF volume. You subtract ECF volume from total body water. How you determine interstitial volume is that you get your ECF volume minus your plasma volume. Remember, the ECF volume is determined using isotonic solutions of plasma and inulin, and the plasma volume, which is the intravascular volume, is measured using is measured using Evans Blue or radioiodinated albumin. So to calculate the interstitial volume, you just subtract the plasma volume from your ECF volume. Now let's look at the dilution principle. The dilution principle is the principle of the conservation of mass. So what is going to happen is that we're going to inject a tracer into our body. Now, the amount of this tracer or the indicator that is injected in the body is known in terms of mass. And this indicator, when it is injected in the body, it is going to have a certain concentration in the body that can be measured. So, mass and concentration of the indicator are going to be known. Therefore, the volume of distribution of an indicator can be calculated using this formula here. Since we know that concentration is equal to mass and volume, the volume of fluid is equal to the mass of the marker over the concentration. So whenever you've been given the mass of the indicator that was injected in the body and the concentration, the volume of distribution of that indicator in a specific compartment that it is measuring can be determined. So this is an example of what we've been talking about. So this is the amount of tracer added in the body. And this indicates that the tracer will have a certain concentration in the body. The 
volume will be determined using this formula here. Volume of distribution is going to be amount indicated over concentration. Okay. Now, sometimes the tracer can be metabolized or it can be removed from the body. So the amount of tracer that you get is the amount of tracer that is in the body at the time of measurement. So for example, if you inject a certain amount of tracer in the body and it is indicated that a certain amount of that tracer was metabolized or it was excreted or it was removed in the body, you have to subtract the amount that was removed in the body so that you can find the exact amount of tracer present in the body. So amount of tracer to remain in the compartment will be the added the injected tracer minus the excreted tracer. This is the amount of tracer that is going to be used to calculate the compartment volume. Okay. So therefore, the volume of distribution is equal to the amount of injected minus any tracer that has been removed from the body by metabolism or excretion during the time allowed for mixing divided by the concentration of the substance in a sample. Now, let's do an example. Look at this question. This very question is what will come in your quiz. It will be very similar to this question. 150 milligrams of sucrose is injected into a 70 kg man. The plasma sucrose level after mixing is 0 0.01 milligrams per meal. And 10 milligrams has been excreted or metabolized during the mixing period. What is the volume of distribution? Okay. So now, sucrose is used to measure ECF. So here we're simply trying to measure ECF. So now, look at this. 150 was injected and 10 milligrams was excreted. So the amount of tracer in the body is simply 150 minus 10, which is 140. And this is the concentration. So the volume of distribution is simply going to be 150 minus 10 over 0 0.01, which is this mathematical expression here. 150 milligrams minus 10 milligrams over 0 0.01 milligrams. If you do the math here, this will give you 140 milligrams. And then the milligrams cancel from the denominator and the numerator. You work out your math, it will give you 14,000 mils. 14,000 mils converted to liters will be 14 liters. So try your might and try to answer this. Try to answer this question here. 10 milligrams of sucrose is injected into a 70 kg man. The plasma sucrose level after mixing is 0 0.01 milligrams per mil. 5 milligrams has been metabolized during this period. Then, what is the ECF volume? I'll give you a minute to just work this out before we do it together. Okay, so let's solve it together. So what is the ECF volume? So the answer is 9.5. What we're going to do is that we're going to, this 100 milligrams was injected, the 5 milligram was metabolized, so 100 minus 5 will give us 95 milligrams, divided by 0 0.01 will give us 9,500 mu. You convert the 9,500 mu by dividing 1,000 in the 9,500 mu, it will give us 9.5 liters. 9.5 liters. Okay. Okay. So let's move on. Look at this question down here. If one mil of solution, which has 10 milligrams per mil, so for every mil there is 10 milligrams of dye is dispersed in chamber B, is injected in chamber B, and final concentration 
the chamber is 0 0.01 milligrams per mil. What is the volume in chamber B? So you know one mil was injected simply meaning that 10 milligrams is the mass in chamber B. So 10 milligrams, nothing was excreted, divided by 0 0.01 will give us 1,000 mils. You convert it to liters to give us 1 liter. But that is how you calculate the body volume of fluid in a compartment using the dilution principle. Now, let's move on to how you calculate the total blood volume. So, blood volume, total blood volume is obtained from plasma volume and hematocrity. So, total blood volume is simply plasma volume times 100 over 100 minus hematocrity. So, example, if the plasma volume is 4 liters and the hematocrity is 0 0.45, which is simply 45%, what is the total blood volume? So, you just replace here. 4 liters times 100 over 100 minus 45. You compute the math and that will give you the answer. Right, so if one knows the plasma volume and the hematocrity, the total blood volume can be calculated by multiplying the plasma volume by this here. So this is an example. The hematocrity is 38 and the plasma volume is 3,500 mils. The total blood volume is going to be 3,500 mils for the plasma volume times 100 over 100 minus hematocrity, which was given as 38. If you compute the math here, it is going to give you 5,645 mils. If you are to convert this to liters, it is going to be 5.6545 liters. So this is how you calculate total blood volume. This is how you calculate total blood volume. It is very, very easy. Most people confuse total blood volume to plasma volume. These are two different things. Remember, plasma volume is simply the liquid component of blood. For you to calculate total blood volume, you have to incorporate hematocrity. You have to in incorporate hematocrity. So total, total blood volume can be calculated from plasma volume and hematocrity. Now, this is a revision of the markers that are used to measure plasma. So, Evans blue attaches to plasma of proteins and is removed by the liver. So, it measures plasma volume. Radioactive labeled 125 albumin measures plasma volume as well. Okay. So, the red cell volume in the blood is what we call hematocrity. And remember, for the packed cells of the blood, most of the volume is occupied by the red blood cells. That's why when we're determining total blood volume, we do not consider white blood cells and we do not consider platelets. We we'll only consider the plasma volume and the red cell volume, which is the hematocrity. Okay. Now let's move on and learn how to calculate lean body mass. So lean body mass is what we call fat-free mass, or the amount of mass in the body that is not attributed to by fat. So total body mass, the total mass of the body, is equals to fat mass plus fat-free mass. Now, the fat-free mass, can be calculated from total body water. This is a relationship between fat-free mass and uh, total body water. So for every 70 mils, pardon me, for every 70 mils, for every 70 mils, there is 100 grams of, of mass. There is, for every 70 mils of water, there's a hundred grams of mass tissue. All right. Now let's take this problem. 
16 adult male weighing 70 kg the total body water was found to be 42 liters what is the bond the lean body mass so we said that for the lean body mass for every 70 mils there's a hundred grams so first of all what we're going to do is that we're going to convert 42 liters into mils which is going to be 42,000 mils so if 70 mils is equals to 100 grams how many grams are in 42,000 mils so let's work out this problem here okay so we know that water content of lean body mass is 70 mils per 100 grams plus the total body water the lean body mass in a 42 liters total body water is a 60 kg so how you arrive at this 60 kg you just get this relationship if 70 mils is equals to 100 grams what about 42000 mils how many grams is it going to be it's going to give you 60,000 grams and then you convert this 60,000 grams to kgs so this will be the total lean body mass so lean body mass is equals to 60 kg this is the mass in this man which is not attributed to fat it is the fat free mass meaning the amount of fat the amount of weight that is attributed to by fat is 60 taken from 70 because his total body weight was 70 and we found that the fat free mass was 60 kg meaning that the remaining mass was due to fat so everybody needs to know how to calculate the fat free mass let's look at the last component of this video which is osmolarity and osmolarity Osmolarity is simply the number of osmos per liter of solution. Okay. The number of osmos per liter of solution. Whereas osmolarity is the number of osmos per kilogram of solvent. Most people ask, what is the difference between osmolarity and osmolarity? Osmolarity osmolarity is affected by the volume of various solutes in the solution and temperature while osmolarity is not affected by that at all so osmolarity is simply the number of dissolved solutes in a solvent which is water divided by the liters of water so this can be likened to molarity in chemistry molarity is equals to moles per liter so just put os in front of molarity to give you osmolarity so osmolarity is equals to osmos per liter so because the dissolved substances in the water in the body are very minute substances they're very small substances instead of using osmos we're going to use milli osmos so they will be measured osmolarity it will be measured in osmos per liter milli osmos per liter milli osmos per liter okay. milli osmos per liter now the osmolarity of plasma has already been determined the osmolarity of plasma is approximately 290 milli osmos per liter close to 300 milli osmos per liter and the particles that contribute to the osmolarity of plasma largely is sodium and chloride okay largely is sodium and chloride now let's look at the term tonicity tonicity is used to describe the osmolarity of a solution relative to that of plasma so what you're simply doing is that you are comparing the osmolarity of a solution to the osmolarity of plasma. The osmolarity of plasma, we've already said, is about 300 milli osmos per liter. Now, there are three states which a solution can take. A solution can either be hypotonic, 
It can be isotonic or it can be hypertonic. If a solution is hypotonic, it means that it has a lower osmolarity compared to plasma, meaning that it has a few dissolved solutes compared to plasma. And what will happen is that if you place a cell in a hypotonic solution, water is going to move from the hypotonic solution to the cell because water follows, follows solutes. So if you put water in, in a hypotonic solution, the cell is going to increase in size or it is going to swell. A hypertonic solution is a solution that has got a higher osmolarity compared to plasma, meaning that it has more dissolved solutes compared to plasma. If you put a cell that has got the same osmolarity as plasma in a hypertonic solution, the water will move from the cell to the solution. Therefore, the cell is going to shrink in size. Thirdly, an isotonic solution is a solution that has got the same osmolarity compared to that of plasma. If you place a cell in an isotonic solution, there won't be any net movement of water. Water will be moving to and fro, but there won't be any net movement. Therefore, the size of the cell is not going to change. It's not going to change at all. All right. Okay. So now, this slide here is simply showing us that... If a 0.9% saline solution remains isotonic because there is no net movement of osmotically active particles in the solution into the cells and the particles are not metabolized. Now, what I want you to understand is this point here. The certain solutions like 5% glucose solution, it is an isotonic solution. But what is going to happen is that glucose can move into the cell. So, when initially infused, it will be isotonic, but glucose is metabolized, meaning it enters the cell. So, when glucose moves from a solution into the cell, the cell will become hypotonic because it has lost a solute glucose. Therefore, water is going to move from the glucose solution into the cell. So, initially, the cell infused was isotonic. But because the solute in the solution, which is glucose, can be metabolized, it will move into the cell, and the cell will become hypotonic. So the water will move from a previously isotonic glucose solution into the cell because it has now become hypotonic because it has lost its solute glucose to the cell. Right. So it is important to note that the relative contributions of the various plasma components to the total or smaller concentrations of plasma. This is simply showing us the plasma uh, solutes that contribute to its osmolarity. So all but the 20 out of the 290 milli or smaller in each liter of normal plasma are contributed by sodium and its company in accompanying anions, which are chloride and bicarbonate. So sodium is positive, chloride and bicarbonate. So the 290 milli or smaller of plasma is largely because of sodium and chloride and bicarbonate. The other cations and anions make a relatively small contribution. Although the concentration of the plasma proteins is large when expressed in grams per liter, they normally contribute less than 2 milli osmos per liter because of their very high molecular weights. So you must know which solutes contribute to the osmolarity of plasma. And most of it is because of sodium and chloride and bicarbonate, which makes up about 270 milli osmolar of that osmolarity. So the major non-electrolytes of plasma that contribute to the osmolarity are glucose and urea, which in the steady state are in equilibrium with cells. Their contributions to osmolarity are normally about 5 milli osmolar per liter each. 
but can become quite high in hyperglycemia or uremia. All right. Now, what is the important of osmolarity? The total plasma osmol osmolarity is important in assessing dehydration. So if the osmolarity is very high, it means that there is dehydration. There is need for you to drink water and to dilute the osmolarity. Overhydration means that the osmolarity becomes low. So there is need to remove water in conditions like heart failure, kidney failure, and liver failure, the body might become overloaded with fluid. So there will be overhydration and the osmolarity is going to reduce. Other electrolyte abnormalities, for example, if you're not able to metabolize chloride, bicarbonate, or sodium, it might lead to derangements in the osmolarity. Okay, so that was osmolarity and how you determine tonicity, hypertonic, hypotonic and isotonic solutions. This is simply telling us how water moves. All right. So if you place it in an isotonic solution, there won't be any net movement. You place it in an isotonic solution, water will move from the cell to the hypertonic solution. You place the cell in a hypotonic solution, water will move from the hypotonic solution to the cell. Therefore, the cell is going to bulge in size. All right. Thank you very much for watching until the end of this video. I hope this will prepare you for the quiz that is coming until the next video that we'll be doing in physiology, which is cellular signaling and transport across the cell membrane. Remember this. The key to making it in medicine and in life is consistency. I'll see you in the next video.